My name is Verlin Rocky. I'm the infamous crazy uncle for Brendan Rocky. Um, I uh, puzzled for two or three weeks over what to, what to really talk about today. And so what I would like to do is kind of address some of the questions that you all have been asking. There was a young lady sitting over here yesterday during Brendan's lecture that asked the question, you know, if, if I'm going to go from conventional ag to sustainable ag, just how long is it going to take? So what I want to do is tell you my story so that I can tell you how long it took Rocky Farms to begin with and then how long it took me in this valley when I moved over here and began doing sustainable tie bag. Um, it all started in 1993. I was farming in the San Luis Valley raising potatoes and it was not working. I was producing potato plants in a lab in test tubes, planting them in the greenhouse, disease-free, planting them in the field. First year in the field, 10% virus infection in the potatoes. Those lots were discarded. I was throwing out huge numbers of quality seed potatoes because it was not working. We had to find a solution. So I made a commitment, and it was a tough commitment. I said, we at Rocky Farms are going to commit 10 years, 10 years to try to do ag without chemistry. There was some opposition from my family, Brenda's dad. Um, there was a lot of opposition from Colorado State University, San Luis Valley Research Center. I, I was even invited out to dinner one day by the lead research scientist at the research center, and he basically said, don't do it. You will become the source of all the virus diseases in the San Luis Valley, and we will blame you. I made the commitment anyway. I really didn't have people like you all that were beginning to believe. I did not have the NRCS supporting me. And for sure, I didn't have the university and folks like Ron Godin helping out. Absolutely no encouragement whatsoever. Not even my neighbors, not even the seed growers were willing to encourage me whatsoever. The other commitment I made is I took 160 acres of land that my father had given me as my inheritance and I gave that land to my brother if I could buy 70 acres, 75 acres of land in Gunnison County and move my family over there. The reason I wanted to have a farm in Gunnison County because there were no other farms in the county. I could grow potatoes a hundred miles away from the San Luis Valley and any other potato fields. I didn't know if it would work. So go ahead and flip through the slides and I'll tell you the one I want to stop on. Not that one. 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 Well, that's this is where I produce uh, potatoes in the lab. Uh, we do it in test tubes. That's my test tube. Uh, it's done by a process called meristemming. Okay, keep going. 
That's not it. That's not it. Keep, keep going. I want the picture of, of a powder horn. <laughs> That's it, huh? I wanted to show you my farm in powder horn that I bought. It was totally virgin ground. It had only been used as a dairy and a horse pasture. It never been farmed, never had had any chemistry on it. I knew from talking to the old timers in the valley that if, if I could grow plant potatoes in virgin ground, that I would have a heck of a crop. So I did. I bought the land over there. My first year, we had less than 500 pounds of potatoes coming off of a half an acre. Very, very low production. But I had the same lots growing in the San Luis Valley on Rocky Farm. The next year when I planted them in the field, the potatoes that emerged from the seed grown of powder horn had twice the plant size of those grown in the San Luis Valley. The research scientist at CSU was also the director of certification, so he had to inspect my field, and I asked him, I says, tell me, tell me why these plants coming from powder horn are twice as big as the ones grown here in the valley in conventional ag. You know what his answer was? They have more vigor. I says, what is vigor? We don't know. Can we measure it? No. But they have more vigor. I wonder what that means. What does that mean? What does that mean? Well, over the years, as we've gone sustainable at Rocky Farms, that, diverse, that, that discrepancy has gone to zero. You cannot tell the difference between Rocky Farm potatoes and powder horn potatoes. Isn't that nice? Isn't that nice? That means that Rocky Farms has been able to bring the soil qualities up to the level of virgin soil, untampered with soil, and, and I, I like that. Uh, go, to, go to the picture with, uh, with potatoes in there. That one, that one, that one. In 2003, that's, it took us 10 years. Um, during that 10 year period, I had done a lot of work with sustainable ag. I found one man, one man who was willing to work with me. He lived in California and he would, he quit his job just so that he could spend time on the internet to help me with sustainable ag. One man. And the first product he came up with, and maybe I should back up just a little bit. Brendan and Jay, they talk in a language that's very, very detailed and very oriented. I developed my own language. And because I really didn't have anybody to talk to and I didn't have seminars to go to. So I, I basically have determined that I need three things in order to, to do sustainable ag. The first thing I need is bugs. The bugs is the microbial life. Okay, I need bugs. The next thing I need That's the food that the bugs can eat and get it right away. The simple carbons. A simple carbon would be sugar, okay? A simple carbon would be pre-digested, uh, 
fermented products with, where the carbon chain are broken down. The last thing I need is slow food. When I made up my mind I wasn't going to use NPK fertilizer, I asked my friend in California if he had anything and he says, I've got molasses. Would you like molasses? So we, the first year, no MPK, molasses. I'm not sure about the spelling. Molasses. How much do I put on? Oh, 50 gallons to the acre. Ship me 100. I put it all on. The crop was nice. I only had maybe a decrease in yield of about 10 hundred weights per acre. It worked well. It worked well. And that's all I did. Just molasses. The next year I said, you know, I need I need another component. I need compost. There's no compost in the San Luis Valley, so I came over to Grand Junction to to Fruta, to Grand Mesa A. I said, do you have compost? Yes, we have lots of it. Is it available? We have no customers. Nobody wants it. I'll take it. How much do you want? Six tons of the acre. How many acres? Six hundred? We hauled it all over the valley. Truckload after truckload. I was asked, man, isn't that expensive? Well, sure, it's really expensive. But guess what? Guess what? It's cheaper than NPK fertilizer. My second component, compost. That's when we began to see things happening. We really weren't putting bugs on yet because we didn't have a product. But I got my bugs and my compost. What I realize now that I didn't have a clue then was that if, if I'd have had compost from the San Luis Valley, I wouldn't have introduced any new species to my environment because if I'm composting stuff that comes off of my place or my neighbor's place, I'm going to get the same bugs that are already there. So I didn't increase any species. What I accidentally did was I went 300 miles away to get my compost, and guess what I got? I got somebody else's bugs. So now I had a broader diversity. So, but my bug source, my bug source, was actually the compost. And I was seeing tremendous, tremendous changes in the soil. And I was glad. I was glad. The next thing that came along was a product that came f from a thousand miles away. And it was the bugs. What it really is, is it is a compost product. We call it compost tea. Those of you that are making compost tea and, and irrigating with it, you know the benefits of it. But guess what? The stuff that we were getting was coming from a thousand miles away, number one. Number two, it was somewhere between 10 and 20 years old and it had somewhere between 10 and 20 different compost items. Steer manure, sheep manure, chicken poo, mushroom uh, trash, wine making trash, beer making trash. It had all of that stuff, all fermented, composted. I mean, all composted and in the product. So it had age, what the age gave us was biodiversity because we had time. We had time for balance to occur in it. We had time. We can make this tea 
put it on, tremendous results. Now we have all three components. We have the tea, the molasses, and the compost. And it worked well. It worked really, really well. And this is about the time that Brendan graduated from college. When Brendan graduated from college, he was a doubter. But you know, doubt is okay. Doubt is great. Because what you have, you have belief on one end. If I'm talking to people that believe, you're not going to think about anything because you already know what I'm saying. If you reject what I say, you're not going to think either because you've already rejected what I said. But if you're somewhere in the middle and you doubt, now I can get you to start thinking. And that's what Brennan was doing. He was a thinker. He was a thinker. You know what he is today? He's a believer and he is a leader. He is a leader. He's a leader, and I like that. I like that. Uh, Brendan comes on the line, and he introduces, he introduces more stuff. He goes with green manure. He goes with companion cropping. And I think I can put companion here too. Biodiversity. It's all working. It's all working. In 2003, Brendan knew everything that I could possibly tell him. He was a believer, kind of. But I told Brendan and his brother, I says, guys, you're the next generation. You don't need your uncle around. You need to fire him. And they did. <laughs> At the same time, my son said, Dad, I want to come back and farm. I said, OK, you can move into the house at Powderhorn. Mom and I, we were tired of 30 below zero winters. So we moved over here. And I bought a place right next to Fruit Growers Reservoir. OK, that's where my place is. This is it. This is my place. I began farming it. I went out, I bought the place, it's four acres. It had a two and a half acre garden, garden spot in the back. That's it. I went back there to take my first soil sample. I pushed on the shovel, I couldn't even get it to go in. I jumped on the shovel, I couldn't get any dirt. It was so hard so compacted. I says, I know who's been here, anhydrous ammonia. Anhydrous ammonia has been here. They used to build runways with that stuff. Anyway, I didn't take my soil sample, so I don't have a clue what I started with. The other thing I had was rocks. I don't mean rocks this side. They were this big. Uh, ditches in the bottom of my ditches where the, the dirt had washed out to the end of the field. And so I had to go down after every irrigation and buck the sand out of my wastewater ditches so that I could drain my field. The next irrigation I irrigated on 34 inch centers just so that I could get the ground wet. So I was irrigating every ditch. Okay. I was irrigating with a half of water. The set time was 24 hours just to get enough percolation so that my potatoes have water. I, I did composting. I didn't buy compost from here. My cousin in the San Luis Valley was making compost, so I asked him for compost. And now I'm bringing compost from the San Luis Valley. A fabulous idea, huh? I didn't realize it at the time, but it worked. I had, I had, I had the compost tea available to me. I had molasses, 
and I had compost from the San Luis Valley. Insect pressure. See that field there? When I started farming this ground here, I had a little garden back there, and I wanted to eat tomatoes, and watermelon, sweet corn. I couldn't grow those over there in the valley. Uh, I could do cantaloupes. And I wanted some cabbage and cauliflower and broccoli, but I couldn't eat it. The reason I couldn't eat the cabbage is because every leaf had a gazillion aphids under it. The broccoli was loaded with aphid. Couldn't eat it. Didn't even want to look at the cauliflower. Aphid. That was the first year in the garden. Second year was the same. The third year the same. The other, the other thing I had was grasshoppers. I have a companion crop to potatoes. It's called garlic. And the grasshoppers would come in and they'd eat, they'd eat those scapes right off. They'd eat the scapes right off. So I had a bazillion grasshoppers on my place and I had a lot of aphids and they were destroying my crop. Year five, year five, with this, with this combination, I could now eat cabbage, no aphids. I could eat my broccoli and cauliflower, no aphids. I went across this field, this exact field that this picture came from. I spent an hour, an hour out there looking for aphids. I know how to scout for aphids. I learned in the valley how to scout for aphids. I didn't find a single one in an hour's time. I walked back there to those trees. See those trees back there? You know what was back there? Milkweed plants. You know what was on the milkweed plants? A gazillion aphids on every one. Black. Black with aphid. Wow. Am I impressed? Yeah. Am I paying attention now? You betcha. The aphid pressure was on the perimeter of the field. Lots of it. Nothing in the field. I had ladybugs in the field. I had the predators. I could find them. Not a single aphid. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? Okay. I think, and I'm, I'm going to make it a mistake. I don't know if the young lady's here or not, but I think that if you use these three components, tea, a good fast food, and a good slow food, that you can take a con conventional field and turn it in a very, very sustainable field in about five years. Okay, so if you need a time, it took us 10 years in the San Luis Valley just to get part way. But the next thing that happened is I wanted to grow a green manure crop and so I planted just straight sedan grass and that's when Brendan was straight sedan grass and so I, I had sedan grass here. Then my garlic the next year were full of spider mites and we had to discard a whole bunch of garlic and the source was sedan grass or corn. So I abandoned the green manure crop. Well, now Brendan's doing multi-species green manure crops. And I said, you know, this intrigues me. I'm going to try this. So I did it this year. So go ahead and... Okay, there it is. There's a nice picture of my green manure crop there. Seven species. It had two broad leaves in it. It had two grasses in it. It had two legumes in it. And it had buckwheat in it. Seven species. Beautiful crop. I harvested my garlic in July. Took us three, four weeks to harvest the garlic in July. I planted this cover crop the first of August. Okay, now. There. Do you see? See that crop? Do you know what day that was that I was mowing that? 
10 September. Before I planted the crop, well, Jack had, I, I told Jack I wanted some compost, and, but I wanted it composted really, really good. So he took it over to TK. TK composted it for me. He delivered 40 yards. I put 40 yards of compost on two acres, seeded this green manure crop, and there it is. I was impressed. I was really impressed. You see how tall it is? See how lush it is? Yeah, nice. Uh, two years ago, go back, go back, go back, go back. Right there. There's my green manure crop from two years ago. Do you know what my seed source was? The weeds that were already in the field. I planted absolutely nothing. This is all volunteer weeds. You have pigweed in there. You have lamb's quarter in there. You have uh, foxtail millet in there. It worked, huh? It worked, there it is. There it is. How much time do I got? 10 more? Okay. The last, last item I want to talk to you is, is that we came up uh, two years ago, maybe three years ago, with another fast food. And it's uh, fermented, fermented uh, fish emulsion and barley straw. It has a little molasses in it. Another component that we came up with is some more bugs. The T, I'm going to call, call the T broad spectrum. And the other one we came up with specific. Specific spectrum microbial life. That's where you have one or two or three or four, maybe 20 or 30 different microbes in a mix, and that's it. But what you're trying to do is address a specific problem. The specific problem that we're dealing with is rhizoctonia. So this specific item has trichoderma in it. So specific, specific. So two years ago, I used specific bugs plus T plus oh, plus the uh, fermented fish plus uh, compost on my powder horn farm as well as on my local farm. I doubled my yields at powder horn. I doubled my yields. I went from 20,000, 25,000 pounds on three acres to 50,000 pounds on three acres. I went from 100 sacks to the acre of potatoes here locally, no, 200 sacks to the acre here locally to 300 sacks. So I didn't quite double my yield but I increased it significantly. What I'm trying to say is that everything that I did during this whole time span was just a small piece of the whole puzzle. Small piece of the whole puzzle. Does this tear off? Yeah. Or not? No, that's fine. I'm, I'm an old man now, and, and old men dream dreams and revel in the past. You know, Brendan and Jay, they're young men, and they have visions. I don't think in detail anymore. I'm broad spectrum. So what I would like to share is that
this thing was all set up before any of us ever had a breath of life. It was, and it's been working, Brendan said, for the last eight to 10,000 years, and I'll buy into that. But it, in my opinion, has a design, has a design. I've written, read several books by scientists, physicists, microbiologists, biologists, chemists, who are frustrated with random order becoming structure and order. They feel that we started with order and we are creating randomness with our, with our activity on the earth. So I'm going to postulate this whole thing began by design. The next component is called the atmosphere, the air. What are the, what are the, what are, what are the inputs to our farming that we get out of the air? Huh? We get rain, we get sunshine, we have oxygen, we have nitrogen, we have carbon dioxide. All those components are in the air. Nitrogen, 78%. Oxygen, 21%. CO2, 0.5 percent in the air. We get water. All of our water comes out of the air. And flows downhill into the reservoirs. Uh, and we get the sun. Energy equals H nu. Planck's constant times frequency. Anytime you have frequency involved in the scenario, you have energy. Energy comes from the sun. All of these components together strike the earth. I'm going to put soil here. Strike the earth. Okay. In the soil, in the soil, we have life. We have life. The life is in the soil. The life is in the soil. From the soil, we harvest a crop. And down here we have man who consumes the crop. Consumer. He's a consumer. If our focus is correct, we will focus Top down, we will try to design. Uh, we will try to understand the design before we ever try to grow a crop. The crop is the least important item in the whole scenario. Man focuses. Well, actually, he focuses on this guy. And in order to fill this guy up, he has to produce a crop. And so he ends up raping the soil in order to produce a quick crop. And he destroys, destroys the design. So his thinking is bottom up. I was sitting back here during Jay's talk and I said, you know, which is easier to do, come down a ladder or climb a ladder? it's easier to come down. The rewards are far greater. Uh, I, I guess I'm supposed to, what am I supposed to do now? I can keep talking, but we have. <laughs> well, I, I don't want, I'm, okay. I, well, you have to understand that this old man is a dreamer. He dreams big dreams. And uh, he has huge soap boxes and a whole bunch of them. I could talk forever. Yeah, I'm JL Vela. And um, 
fourth generation there on our place. Family came in in late 1800s and we started that. The only difference is between what Verlin here has talked about and what we do is, well, there's a lot of difference actually. We put, this will be a cow, <laughs> a quick cow. And for the last 120 years that we've been doing stuff, our way of looking at stuff has been this way, from the cow to the soil, or from the cow to the crop, and then up. But as I said, fourth generation with uh, fifth generation on the way, starting to get more, uh, there we go, starting to get more um, interested in, in trying to make this place last for, you know, generation after generation again, and starting to realize that there's a lot of things that we have to do differently. Um, so right now we're still in kind of this upward thing. We're trying to turn it around and come back down. So you got a guy here with a lot of experience that knows, I guess that's what they wanted me to talk about, two ends of the spectrum. So young guy just getting started in it and um, somebody that's, uh, that actually knows what they're doing. <laughs> But I, I guess a couple of things, mine's just going to be real brief, but a couple of things that we have started to do, and I mean, a lot of it wasn't really with the intention of soil health. Um, like last year, we had, there was a lot of property, a lot of ground that we were unable to irrigate because of the water situation. So we, stuff still grows there, but it's not really what you'd expect. It's, you know, your, your pig weeds and all your other weeds. So we just came through, we cut it, bailed it, and uh, pretty much just took it off the field and we mix it in with uh, some corn silage and stuff and we feed that to our cattle. And it, it's helped us get through this year. Um, and then another thing, we've, worked, we've been working with the NRCS. I know they're, uh, they're definitely in, in high agreement with me that we still are learning as to what we're doing. Um, they keep track of it, I guess. They'll, they'll actually pay you to keep track of this kind of stuff. Um, so I, I, think, I think we're getting a little bit better, slowly. Right, John? <laughs> we're trying. Um, but this year we're working with the NRCS again uh, to, on another project that we have, another piece of property that we have and we farm and all that. Generally, that, that property is just mainly grass and for grazing. And for the last few years, we've been able to uh, utilize the neighbors. We're, we're fortunate to have um, a dairy just uphill from us. And we're able to utilize a lot of their uh, lagoon water and their waste, their waste water out of their uh, lagoon pits. And with this NRCS project, it'll definitely be a lot easier to, uh, to utilize that stuff and spread that over our fields. Um, like I said, really, I, I'm, there's not a whole lot. I basically came here to learn, and um, I somehow got conned into getting up here and, and talking in front of everybody, so. <laughs> What's that? Yeah, I guess. <laughs> so, per pretty much, that's basically... All I have, um, like I said, that's we're on the other end of the spectrum, trying to trying to do the same type of thing, and and we're learning. I guess I'm just going to leave that up to questions now. But. Any questions for JL? Don't you just love the tools that they have?